Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good day everyone. Today we shall discuss about another important aspect of immune disorders, one that is likely chance that you'll pick it up in your clinic somewhere or in the practice, which is systemic lupus erythematosus, commonly abbreviated as SLE. Now, if you have a look at the spectrum of SLE, it's not a single entity. It's actually a combination of multifactorial origins, which have an interplay between genetic, environmental and immunological factors. But the cornerstone of this disorder remains the production of autoantibodies in this context known as ANA or anti-nuclear antibodies. What they do to the body is insight and immunological response resulting in damage to one's own tissues. We will have a look at all of these in a lot of detail in the ensuing slides. But remember that there is principal injury to a multitude of tissues in the body, chief amongst them being the skin, the serosal surfaces such as the joints, kidney and also the other membranous areas. We will have again a look at it in the pathology section. Another important trivia about SLE is the prevalence of this disorder is very high amongst women. They outnumber men 9 is to 1. Now this has to do with the role of sex hormones and also the production of different mediators uh, driven by genes affecting the X chromosomes. We will have a look at it in later slides. The hallmark feature as I reiterate is autoantibodies. Now these are antibodies which are tagged against different antigens. The location of these antigens may be the nucleus or the cytoplasmic component of the cell. Now what is the relevance of picking up this? Number one, it is diagnostic. When you see an anti-nuclear antibody, it is diagnostic of an immune disorder and also it helps the pathogenesis is also slightly explained by the presence of this typical antibody. More importantly, however, it drives the management. The role of management of these patients with SLE is chiefly derived from the type of antibodies that you see. And just to underline the point, you can see on your screen here, the top left you can see the antibodies can bind to double standard DNA, it can bind to histones, it can bind to non-histone molecules which are bound to RNA or it can be even the nucleolar antigen. So you see a spectrum there where the antibodies can latch themselves on to different aspects of the cell. If you look at any garden variety of tables which give you the litany of antibodies which are seen in SLE, it can range from somewhere like anti double standard DNA. The positivity of that in an SLE may range somewhere between 40 to 60 percent, but chiefly the prototype example is what is called as lupus nephritis, where you can see a lot of these antibodies against the DNA. Other than that, you can have anti U1 ribonucleoprotein. The prevalence may be not as much high as anti DNA, but they are SLE specific anti-SM or anti-Smith antigen is also very specific, seen around 20 to 30 percent of the cases. As you scroll down the table, you can see there are other spectrum of antibodies such as anti-Rho and anti-La called SSA and SSP respectively. Uh, this is typically seen in a congenital heart block or even in neonatal lupus, very rare conditions. But when you see these antibodies, they are pathognomonic of these conditions. You can have antibodies against phospholipids around 30 to 40 percent of the cases. Apply is a template for that. And then you can have a generic anti-nuclear antibodies, which the prevalence may range upward of 90 percent, but they are not diagnostic of SLE. You may see it overlap with some other connective tissue disorders. Now, the staining pattern of these anti-nuclear antibodies is of relevance because they will tell you or a microbiologist or a pathologist that this is a particular underlying disorder. Accordingly, as you can see up on your screen here, the top right corner, you can have what is called as the rim pattern where the antibodies are seen along the nuclear membrane. Now, this is very typical for SLE. When you see it, you know you are dealing with an SLE. You can have a homogeneous staining of the nucleus, entire nucleus is uniformly stained as you can see on the top right. It is usually with the drug induced conditions like drug induced lupus. You can have a speckled or a mottled pattern. You can see in the bottom of the screen there. This is to do with anti-SM, which is again true in case of SLE. Or you can get a nucleolar pattern where it stains only the 
nucleoli within the nucleus which is seen in systemic sclerosis. Just to summarize what we have seen in the previous slide, you can have a homogeneous pattern as you can see is typical for double stranded DNA. You can have rim or peripheral staining which is again an envelope protein, you can have speckle pattern remember SM antigen there again specific for SLE nucleolar and then the centromeric pattern make up the rest of them. So five particular patterns that you see and what is the test that we do to demonstrate these patterns? Nothing but indirect immunofluorescence. Sometimes we forget that these antibodies do not necessarily restrict themselves to the solid organs. It has to do with the blood components as well. If you read through the literature on anemias and thrombocytopenias, you will see the role of these autoantibodies there as well. Example against the RBCs, we know about AIHA. Against platelets, we talk about ITP. Okay? Accordingly, you can see them affect the lymphocytes as well. And even in phospholipids, in 30 to 40 percent of the cases, as we have seen in a couple of slides earlier you will see them in APLA as well which causes a lot of venous and arterial thrombotic disorders and a thrombotic screen may be required to go through the pathogenesis of these patients. As we have seen earlier, it is not a single entity but there is a constant interplay between different factors, genetic, immunological and environmental. One cannot do without the other. Genetic factors as we come to each of these entities under the etiopathogenesis of SLE. Now we have seen that somebody with an SLE has a family history. If you care enough to take a lot of family history from these patients, you will realize that there is a maternal uncle, there is a sibling, there is a parent who is affected by SLE. Clearly the underlying feature is a genetic link. So when there is a family history, the chances that a kin of this family has an increased risk of SLE exponentially increases. There are a lot of these cross-sectional studies which tell you there is an emphasis on the genetic factors where they see the prevalence of SLE is very high in identical or monozygotic twins vis-a-vis -vis dizygotic or fraternal or non-identical twins where the prevalence may be hovering around 3 percent. Now this clearly demarcates a lot of genetic factors. Outside of this you can see the MHC class associations which were dealt with a couple of classes earlier, HLA molecules to do specifically here HLA class 2 alleles such as DQ, you may have the anti double stranded DNA or anti-Smith which is affected here or you may have an inherited defect of the complement itself. The components of the complement are not there. So what happens to immune complexes? They are not scavenged or the macrophages that are supposed to be recruited to these apoptotic cells are not there. All of this results in a overlong stay of these damaged cells. So they induce a lot of antibody productions, sometimes can be detrimental to the person itself which is anti-nuclear antigen or some of the scientists in the recent years have developed areas of interest such as the genetic loci encoding proteins in signaling of the lymphocytes. We know there is an interplay between the lymphocytes which generate a lot of these molecules which activates their own kin and these mount a response against the antigen. Now what if this is deranged by some underlying genetic defect? So the lymphocytes instead of halting their production of antibodies can produce an excess of that. That also can result in SLE. Coming to the immunological factors, principally it has to do with the breakdown of your tolerance which we have spoken that about it in a lot of detail in the previous class where self or immunological tolerance is completely in tatters. Now what happens to the components of these tolerance such as CD4 helper cells, now, what happens to those? They escape recognition, they are specific for nucleosomal antigens and escape ex recognition by the body system. Now what should that do? There is recognition of these as foreign and it is attacked. Toll like receptors, you may want to refer to the earlier classes on microbes where these act like receptors for identifying the components of your microbes. Now engagement of the toll like receptors by DNA and RNA of the host cells, what does that do? It activates your B cells and produces a lot of autoantibodies, sometimes against your own DNA and RNA, something like a molecular mimicry. Now type 1 interferons are also relevant here because they also elaborate a lot of factors which can release autoantibodies from the B cells, especially the self nucleic acids can mimic a microbe. So when the mount, especially the self nucleic acid can mimic a microbe. So when the response is mounted against the microbe, a similar insult is also tagged against self nucleic acid resulting in antinuclear antibodies. You also have the environmental triggers, needless to say it is a popular trend that you see with people with SLE. As they walk out in the sunlight, they develop rashes all over the body. You might have heard about it, read about it or you may have relatives 
who may have experienced this. Because UV light which is present in the spectrum of the sunlight induces apoptosis of cells in your keratinocytes in the skin. Now, what happens to this? These keratinocytes of course are scavenged away by apoptosis, but there is some amount of bystander damage to the adjoining cells resulting in damage to the DNA. It alters the DNA and then the content of the DNA is of interest which is altered already becomes highly immunogenic. Also there is production of lot of interleukins, typically interleukin 1 which incites pro-inflammatory mediators which damages the cells further. Now that is a vicious cycle, so damage cells means exposure to of the antigens and mounting of response. We also have dealt that the prevalence is very high in the females, it has to do with the sex hormones and the expression by one of the inactivated of course one X chromosome is inactivated, the other one is active and the genes which are present on that X chromosome arm have to do a lot with and also the expression of this. That is why you will see them very prevalent along the reproductive age group in females. Drugs such as d or hydrolysines, they also are very important because they modify the response of the body. So, these are some of the environmental triggers which can precipitate an SLE. Now, how do we put all these three together? So, a normal model which has been suggested for pathogenesis of SLE looks something like this. You are endowed with susceptibility genes example HLA molecules and there is a breakdown of your self tolerance. So, what should happen? Your B and T cells will recognize your body's own tissues as foreign. Alongside simultaneously you have an environmental insult such as an exposure to sunlight, your UV rays are damaging the keratinocytes. So, the apoptotic cells are not being effectively scavenged away, they overstay their welcome and what happens is you have an increased burden of nuclear antigens. Put these together and this is a recipe for formation of immune complexes aka anti-nuclear antibodies. Now these anti-nuclear antibodies something has to be done about them, they cannot stay there. So what happens? Your body tries to mount a response. Your chronic inflammatory cells chief among them being the phagocytes will come there, try to scavenge these immune complexes. Unsuccessfully though because what they do is they engage the toll like receptors within the cells. Now this results in elaboration of more and more like minded cells resulting in anti body production. Some of it will be mounted against the nucleic acid components. So, you get a lot of churning out of anti nuclear antibodies which is a very high titer and then that precipitates the pathogenesis of the disease. Having known about what is SLE, what is the etiopathogenesis of the same? We want to know what are the diagnostic criteria, when do you tag a person as having an SLE? The 1997 revised criteria still stands even after 21 years. There are 11 criteria which have been set, 4 of these to be met, then you can successfully call a patient as having SLE. Now what are those? We will run through that in the ensuing list. As you can see up on your screen there, you have what is called as a litany of those 11 conditions and the criterion basically as we call it and the definition of that criteria. We will run through that in little brief in the couple of slides. The first one is a malar rash, as you know among the malar eminence your nasolabial area, they develop a rash which is an erythematous rash generally which is very red, sometimes very flat, sometimes very raised. Or you can have a other manifestation of that which is called as a discoid rash which looks like a disc, that is why it is called discoid. Now I have some images of that later but they are nothing but raised patches with a lot of keratoting, plugging and scarring. Sometimes even atrophic nature of that results in formation of a disc almost like your carom coins. Then you have photosensitivity which was alluded to earlier. They develop a skin rash as a result of exposure to UV light. They may have oral ulcers, oral or even nasopharyngeal ulcerations which are generally painless, it does not attract attention but when a phys physician is doing a general examination, he or she may notice it. Uh, concomitantly. Arthritis, remember here it is a non erosive arthritis and it has to involve the peripheral joints, it has to involve more than 2 joints. Okay, so, this is characterized either by tenderness, swelling or effusion. These are important criterion to differentiate it from some other uh, destructive arthritis which can affect at any age group. This is an important criterion to remember. Serocytes as we know, the serosal cavities, you take an example of pleura and the pericardium. They develop inflammation, pleuritis and pericarditis respectively, which is demonstrable by general or radiological examination. 
renal disorder which will come to that in the morphology a bit later but remember this persistent proteinuria which is more than 0.5 gram per deciliter which is translated to more than 3 plus on a dipstick quantitative analysis of urine or you may have cellular cars those cars can range from RBC granular hemoglobin related cast, it can have tubular cast or even a mixed cast. So, we have these formed elements being present in urine examination, you may be talking in the context of SLE. Neurological ones, yes, CNS also is affected. The patient may have seizures or psychosis, but pertinent to remember that you have to rule out other conditions which can precipitate this such as drugs or metabolic derangements. Outside of this, you may call a patient as SLE. Hematological, of course, hemolytic anemia, leukopenia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. Of course, the cutoffs are given there on your screen. Now, when you see this, it's important to remember, especially given the profile of the patient, that you have to look actively for whether it's SLE or not. You should be judicious enough to order for a spectrum of antibody serological profile. Immunological disorders such as anti double standard DNA or anti Smith or anti phospholipid as we have seen earlier, you do an indirect immunofluorescence and you should be able to demonstrate the same. And then you have anti nuclear antibodies which is an abnormally high titer of anti nuclear antibody which is demonstrated like I said earlier about immunofluorescence is the method of choice or you may resort to another method which is equivalent in terms of its testing uh, which should be at any given point in time it should highlight the presence of this ANA in the absence however of drugs or drug induced lupus, those are the conditions that you have to rule out. So, 4 out of these 11 do meet, it is SLE. So, the fans of acronyms may want to call something like this MD SOAP and BRAIN which stands of course as you can see on your screen, something to remember these 11 criteria. Now, what happens at the level of the tissue in SLE? Having dealt with the criteria, having dealt with etiopathogenesis, what is happening to your tissues? So, mechanisms of tissue injury as we have seen earlier on hypersensitivity reaction, this is a prototype example of type 3 where there is circulating immune complexes, they navigate through small channels, they get deposited in areas of course, the use up complement, so the serum level of complement do drop and get deposited in the tissue and inside a reaction. Your screen is showing there an image of the kidney which is an immunofluorescence image showing the granular nature of deposit of the immune complexes. Other than that, you can have antibodies targeted against RBCWEs and platelets. What happens as a result of this? They are like markings, it is like a target on the back. So, you know, those cells have become opsonized or being recognized now by the body's mechanism and eventually will be rendered phagocytosed and then they will be lysed. So, this is another important mechanism, that is why your numbers dwindle and come down and levels of RBC, WBC platelets all come down because of this mechanism that is phagocytosis and lysis. It is also pertinent to note, there is a small trivia on this area, the damaged cell nuclei being bind to the antinuclear antibodies, they lose their integrity or their chromatin texture and become very homogeneous. So, you get a mass which is a combination of ANA and the damaged cell nuclei. These are what are called as LE bodies or also sometimes referred to in literature as hematoxylin bodies. And what happens to those? They are scavenged or phagocytosed by neutrophils and you get what is called as LE cell phenomenon. Now, this phenomenon is of interest because you see it in PCV, in the buffy coat layer, you will put it up under microscopy, this is present there. But of course, this remains of academic interest because the serological tests and the titers of antibodies have vastly replaced this particular mechanism, but still it is being followed in many centers. An image of light microscopy, you can see this is a cell in the center which has a lot of pink material engulfed within the cytoplasm, is called as a LE cell that is the one there. Other than that, you have APLA which I have spoken about earlier, we get a lot of venous and arterial thrombosis. These have to do with antibodies demonstrated against endothelium, platelets and clotting factors. So, there are a lot of complications which they come to at the time of presentations. Now, come to the last aspect of SLE which is the morphological changes. Skin, the largest organ of the body, you get a malar rash which is typified by a lot of vacuolar degeneration of the basal layer, you get dermal edema that is got to do with the injury. Sometimes you get fibrinoid necrosis of the vessels which is called as vasculitis. So, they may have on gross examination have bullae, urticarial rashes, macular papillar rashes and as we have studied earlier, exposure to sunlight accentuates this reaction. Now, this is a typical malar rash which is called as a butterfly shaped rash sometimes on the malar eminences of your nasolabian fold as seen in the representative image there. 
A discoid rash, as spoken to earlier, more disc or carom coin like rashes can be on the face and also on the extremities. Typically in both of these conditions you will see lymphatic degeneration of the basal layer and also edema and if you care enough to do an immunofluorence of indirect nature you will see deposition of immunoglobulins along the dermoepidermal junction just like the lower image it shows you like a hillock the green one represents the deposition of the antibodies at the dermoepidermal junction. This is to demonstrate the vacuolar degeneration of the basal layer. The other organs joints we have spoken about is non-damaging, non-erosive synovitis. In the spleen, spleen is generally enlarged because of production of a lot of antibodies from the white pulp and if you concentrate on the white pulp you will get the concentric areas of hyperplasia of the lymphoid follicles referred to as an onion skin lesion. CNS you can have vasculitis or sometimes non-inflammatory occlusion of vessels resulting in uh, almost stroke like conditions. Lung it can affect the pleura and the, peri uh, the pleural layers causing pleuritis and effusions similarly to be with pericardium. Eventually what happens is because of the small exudate becomes larger what is called as fibrinous exudate they get organized and become fibroting and non-functional that is why you can hear when you put a stethoscope over the chest of the patient you can hear the rub okay that particular pleural or pericardial rub. In the cardiovascular system it affects all three layers of the heart but take a point to note the valvular endocarditis affecting the valves you get what is called as non-bacterial verrucous endocarditis also referred to in your books as Libman Sachs endocarditis. Now this is very important as you can see in the schematic representation on the screen there they affects the valvi leaflets on either surface of the leaflet they are very small warty depositions ranging in diameter between 1 to 3 millimeters. Now these are very important because they are multiple in number and they are present there you have to distinguish from other conditions which have similar features such as a vegetation in infective endocarditis which are large friable and bulky and they destroy the entire structure of your leaflet and the cordae. Another important condition is verruque where you see in conditions such as rheumatic heart disease where these are multiple small tiny in number also looking very similar to that of SLE. So it is a differential diagnosis there for a pathologist. The last aspect of this is the kidney where you get a spectrum of morphological changes often asked in the exams which is the class 1 to class 6 criteria. Now just to demonstrate a control or normal glomerulus you can have light microscopy image on the left of your screen and you have a representative schematic illustration. You can look at the illustration that uh, your glomerulus looks very complicated but you a glomerulus looks very complicated on light microscopy but if you skim it down you will see that there is the yellow part which is the endothelium, the red part which is your mesangium, mesangial matrix and then you will have the vessel portocytes which, which is en almost encasing it uh, which is uh, represented in green. Now if you extrapolate this to the entire glomerulus it looks something like this ok. So if you remember this particular image you can look at the rest of it. The class 1 is called as minimal mesangial. The name itself suggests that it involves a mesangium but very minimalistic. Needless to say the patient may not have signs and symptoms at this particular stage or class 1. You can get only immune complex deposition in the mesangium and they are identified by immunofluorescence. Class 2 slightly an advanced nature from class 1 which is mesangial proliferative. So you will see slight increase in the mesangium as represented by the pink areas there. The mesangial cells hypercellularity comes to fore there. The cells increase in your mesangium. So the patient will have mild proteinuria. The symptomatology do increase. Transient proteinuria, mild hematuria are the usual manifestations. And of course immunofluorescence will tell you there are granular nature of deposits of uh, immune complexes and the complement along the mesangium. Class 3 is what is called as focal lupus nephritis. The word focal refers to the number of glomeruli in the cross section which are involved. If you get less than 50 percent of the glomerular involvement you can call it. it if you take a glomerulus in for example on your screen there less than 50 percent of the glomerula involved then it is called as focal. You can see that the tufts show increase in the level of fibrinoid deposits and small, small hyaline thrombi within the lumen of the capillaries. So they may have more of this hematuria and proteinuria. Class 4 is diffuse lupus where more than 50 percent of the glomerulus is affected. They become hypercellular and develop what is called as moon shaped areas called crescents which sometimes called as crescentic glomerulonephritis along with fibrinoid necrosis 
You can see a lot of thrombi. These are changes which you see in class 3 as well. And sometimes you get subendothelial deposition of immune complexes resulting in what is called as viral loop lesions. They are typical of diffuse lupus nephritis. Needless to say, the patient will have symptoms. In addition, you may see the patient having hypertension. The profile of a patient is having a high blood pressure for some number of years and then renal insufficiency starts to set in, what is called as acute renal failure. Now this is an image of the class 4. You can see a very hypercellular mesangial uh, area and entire glomerulus in fact is very uh, hypercellular. And on the inset on the screen, you can see Jones methinamine stained silver, which is staining your wire loop lesions. You can see them almost like a meshed areas of wire loop. This is the immunoglobulin uh, deposits that you see uh, in diffuse proliferative lupus nephritis in the kidney. The apple green nature of it will demonstrate the mesangial deposits and subendothelial deposits also. Per adic acid shift or pass is a very good stain to demonstrate wire loop lesions. Here you can see areas which are marked in magenta pink, which are areas which are the vessels which are proliferating. Class 5 is the penultimate one which is called as membranous glomerulonephritis, where you get widespread thickening of the capillary walls and lot of sub-epithelial immunocomplex depositions along with lot of basement membrane-like deposition. Now these patients usually have a profile of a nephrotic syndrome. They come with telltale features of nephrotic syndrome and when you do an immunofluorescence is one where you can think of SLE. And the class 6, the last stage is called as advanced sclerosing lupus nephritis. Sclerosis suggests more than 90 percent of the glomerula have undergone solidification or obsolescence type of sclerosis, non-functional glomeruli at the end of the day. And this is ESRD or end stage renal disease where nephrologists tend to call it CKD class 5. Now when this is there, the kidney is absolutely non-functional. The patient has to resort to hemodialysis or ultimately a renal transplant. As you can see, SLE can affect the kidney in a multitude of the ways from very minimalistic change to a high end spectrum where the entire kidney is completely shut down. So this winds up the class on SLE. Please note that the pathogenesis, the revised criteria for diagnosis and the effect on multiple organs are the ones which are of point of interest in this particular subject. Thank you. Have a good day.